Good morning. Good to see everyone today. And uh, just uh, congratulations to Alyssa and Micah on uh, graduation. And it's, it's exciting. Let's get it. Good work. We won't tell them, but now the hard work's ahead. <laughs> And uh, I know you join in with uh, Tom and I, and we're glad that Mark and Karen got a chance to get away for a few days and hope that they get some rest and, and refreshment. And uh, we just are so thankful for, for Mark and Karen. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to try to kind of dovetail a little bit where. Mark has been in, in the book of Romans. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformed to his death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for special time of, of worship already today. We do. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the resurrection. And Lord, we do ask by your grace that we would know him better and love him more and serve him sincerely. We pray for Mark and Karen refresh them today, continue to give to them strength for the days ahead. Lord, now we pray that your word would work in our life, changes, conform us, move us. In Jesus' name. Well, I'm sure you've heard the the saying that it's not what you know that's most important, but who you know. And I think there's probably some people here that have probably been caught on the negative side of that. Where, you know, you've, you've put your time in, you've, you've worked hard, and you've, you've looked for that advancement, you've maybe looked for that uh, new position, only for it to go to the boss's buddy. Or maybe one of the family members of the owner. And sometimes when that happens, it, it, it leads to maybe a, a new occupation or maybe a, a new business being started. Sometimes it's uh, the other way. You know, you've, you've put the research in, you, you've put the, the hard work in, and, and you just know you have a great idea. You have this great product, and Everyone that's looked at it so far just said, eh, you know. And you just know if the right person, if the right person sees it at the right time, it'll go. I think there's a, a few companies out there that uh, people said would never make it. And, uh, well, uh, Amazon and company, here they are. But in our spiritual walk, in our walk of faith, it really is true. It's not what you know that's most important, but it's who you know. Because who you know will lead to what you believe in, really how you live. Now Paul, let me just remind us, he's writing to a very special group of people. And uh, he, he's, he's writing from this uh, palatial prison cell. And the fond memories that he has of the Philippian church, it, it was 10 years earlier that the, the church was birthed. And, and you remember the, the Macedonian call, and, and Paul was headed one direction, and God sends him another. And through all of these circumstances, he ends up in Philippi. 
And Philippi was the first European church plant. First church in Europe. But there was a few things that Paul wanted to, to do. He wanted to encourage the believers. He wanted them to uh, stick with it. Keep following Christ. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the people that want you to mark your body. People that want you to follow the, uh, the law or the teachings of the law. Just to gain favor with God. He said Christ has done that. Christ has finished the work. Christ has, through Christ, that's where we have peace with God. And with Him alone. Seek his mind, seek his attitude, his likeness. He is our life, he is our goal, he is our strength. Now, of course, we know that Paul was a, a Pharisee. Now, if anybody would know God, you would think he would be a Pharisee. Right? I don't think so. And the wouldn't you say that uh, it's not as important what we say about God as much as it is about what God says about us? I'd like us to look at what Jesus thought of a Pharisee. Turn to Matthew chapter 23, if you would. And uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> it's not flattering what Jesus thought of Pharisees. And the, they call it the, the eight woes. And it's going to be kind of a, a lengthy passage, but stick with me here. And uh, if I can say, you don't, we don't want to be this guy. We don't want to be in this group. Look at verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on the sea and land and make one uh, proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides who say, whosoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, <laughs> that is obvious. You fools and blind men. Which is more important, the gold of the temple or the sanctu the sanctu the one who sanctified the gold, the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears uh, by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men. Which is more important, the offering or the altar that the sacrifices that sacrifices the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and Cumin, and have neglected the uh, weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Well, I kind of have a feeling that the enrollment in the Pharisee school kind of dropped after this. You lie, hypocrites, you liars, you, wow, 
Jesus didn't think very highly of hypocrites. You know, God knows you. He knows me. Uh, First Samuel tells us that man looks on the outward appearance, but God, he looks on the heart. Turn to Psalm 139, would you please? This will be a very familiar passage uh, to most of us. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and you know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word in my mouth, behold, O Lord, you know all. God knows us. Um, you know, there'll be a time that all of us will stand before him. And the question is, will God know us then? There's a, a portion in the Bible where Jesus said that there will be a group of people who think because of what they've done will give them access to heaven. They'll say, boy, we did this in your name, we've done this in your name, and Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And then there will be a group of people because of Jesus, because of what he's done, and, and seeing what he wanted them to do will be welcomed into their eternal home. You know, Jesus knew Saul. Uh, we know him as Paul. But he knew him really well. And the risen Christ met Paul on uh, a trip uh, to Damascus. And I'd just like us to go over to Acts chapter 8 real quick, and, and, or chapter 9, and uh, just kind of refresh our memory a little bit. This is on the heels of uh, Peter, or not Peter, but Stephen, uh, being stoned. And uh, man, there is just a, a lot of energy in Jerusalem at this time. And, and Paul has been emboldened because of this. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing uh, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus. So that if he found anyone belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. From that moment on, after Paul met Jesus, he was determined to know him more. Not the historical Jesus. Not the crucified Jesus, but the risen Jesus. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Without the resurrection, there's no church. Without the resurrection, there's no faith. Without the risen Christ, Paul says, we waste our time. We waste our energy. But face to face, he met the risen Christ. 
And from that moment on, he wanted to know him. You know, I've met a lot of people through the years. Um, they believe that Jesus died on the cross and, and was raised from the dead. They're heaven bound. But they miss out so much in life. don't know there is a Christ. And I'd just like to take a couple of minutes. I, I went through and I, I wrote some things down that uh, Paul learned to know about Jesus. He was the Almighty One who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. The Alpha, the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's our advocate. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if any man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who holds all authority in heaven and in earth. He's the bread of life. He's the beloved Son of God, the Bridegroom, the chief cornerstone, the Deliverer, and to wait for His Son from heaven, who He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He's faithful and true. He's the Good Shepherd, the Great High Priest. Therefore, since we have a Great High Priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. He's the head of the church, the holy servant of God, the great I am, the Emmanuel, God with us, the indescribable gift, the judge, the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the lamb of God, the light of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's Lord of all. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's our mediator. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's our Messiah, the Mighty One, the One who sets us free, the One who redeemed us, our hope. He's our peace. He's our prophet. He's our Redeemer. He's our risen Lord. He's our rock. He's our sacrifice for our sins. He's our Savior. He's the Son of Man, the Son of the Most High God, the Supreme Creator over all. By Him, all things were created, both in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the door, the way, the word, the body, the truth. He's the victorious one. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Paul was growing to love Jesus more and more because he was learning to know him. And we know, when we know him, we love him. And when we love him, we want to serve him. My friend, uh, Mark Crane, says this frequently. He's the elder uh, lead uh, teacher there at New Hope. He says, when it comes to conflict, facing conflict in life, what you believe about God will determine what you do next. David's courage with Goliath, where did that come? 
Where did the courage from this one lad who stepped foot on the battleground and stood toe-to-toe with the giant warrior, where did that come from? It's what he believed about God. He simply said the battle is the Lord's. What about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? What is it that allowed these young men to stand? God is able. You may do this, O king, but God is able to deliver us. And God did. It's kind of interesting, you know, as, as Paul talks about knowing him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. At the birth of the church of Philippi, I mean, Paul and Silas took a woman. I mean, a beating, and they were thrown into prison. Thrown into jail, and uh, of course, it's kind of interesting how that turned out, but what happened? We didn't hear Paul saying, hey, listen, I want my attorney. I've got a phone call to make. Uh, I'm a Roman citizen. At midnight, what in the world could motivate two men who were beaten severely to break out in song? It says they sang a hymn. They didn't sing a song. They sang a hymn that had a that had a uh, some biblical lyrics and a tune. the earth shook. The prison doors came open. And the guard was afraid that all the prisoners had left. And Paul says, no, 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 don't hurt yourself. We're here. He comes to know Jesus. His family knows Jesus. They didn't baptize. And the birth of the church takes place through the fellowship of his suffering. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. <laughs> that church was born through suffering. Salvation came to us through the suffering of Jesus Christ. A couple questions. Will you be recognized on that day? Will the Lord say, welcome, come in to your everlasting home? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know Him as your Savior? Jesus came to save sinners. And we're all in need. Do you know the risen Christ? The one who paid the price for your sins? The one who's forgiven you? The one who's redeemed you? The one who bought you with a price? With his precious blood? Do you know him? I mean, do you know him? I'm not talking about the historical Christ. I'm not talking about crucifying Christ. Do you know the risen Christ? Are you getting to know him more? God's people, the more we know about Christ, the, know, the more we know him, the more we love him. And the more we love him, the more we want to serve him. Paul knew Christ. And he was getting to know him more. 
That's why he could tell the, the church at Philippi, be thankful. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Don't be anxious. Don't be. Stop your worry. Give everything to God in prayer. Don't worry about what you have. My God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. And don't worry if you're not up to the task. Because you're not. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The older we get in Christ, the more important this is. Because one of the things that we do in relationships, especially when we, we've known someone for a long time, is we begin to take them for granted. May we never take the grace of God in Jesus Christ for granted. There's no better time than today To continue that journey of knowing Him and loving Him and serving Him, for we'll spend eternity. After Tom prays, I uh, hope you can uh, get a chance to say hi to, to Jennifer and, and uh, to greet one another. And, uh, May we go forth and serve our Savior and know Him. Come on. Tell me to lead us in Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are called to the joy of knowing your Son, our <coughs> Savior, the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to desire that, to know you better, to find our rest in you, our fulfillment, the joy of our lives in knowing Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord God, to love you and then to serve you better. Pray for mercy upon this congregation that we would go forth praying for loved ones, neighbors, and people that do not know you. Lord, we pray for your hand of mercy upon our president and our law enforcement people as they have the difficult task of maintaining order in this country. May your grace rest upon them, and may we be Christ-honoring people. We thank you for our time together in Jesus' name. Have a good week, church.